This is Brad with the Prairie Art Gallery, and with us today we have uh, Derek Riley. He's going to be exhibiting at the Prairie Art Gallery from March 3rd through uh, March 24th. Welcome to the gallery. Thank you. I looked at your work, and I'm not sure if I get to comprehend exactly what what your work entails. Can you describe to me what what, what you're going to be exhibiting at the Prairie? Okay, it's a, it's a lot of printmaking that I'm going to be showing up there. Most of it's going to be woodcuts. And it's uh, it's just a carving in a block of wood and printed like a big rubber stamp. And uh, I'll also have some silk screens, which, which are a little easier uh, to understand because it's it's still used widely for T-shirts and, and band posters, and, and most people do know about silk screen. So mm-hmm. I've got some silk screens I'm going to be sending up too, but for the most part, it's all going to be woodcuts. Okay, the woodcuts, man. How, what's the process of creating a, a woodcut print? Uh, well, the first thing I do is get a block of wood, and I'll and I'll figure out what I want to put on it, and I sketch it out in pencil, and then I draw the whole thing out again in, in sharpie, and and I draw it exactly how I want it to look, and at that point I'll stain the block red, so that I can see where I've carved. So how and, big uh, are these blocks of wood, though? Uh, well, they're various sizes. I've got I've got any of them from from about six inches by ten inches to to four foot by eight foot, mm-hmm. um, which is the biggest I, I have the capabilities of printing here. So uh, it, it's a, it's a pretty wide range, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be sending a, a, a wide range of, of size pieces up to the show as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, you so you lay down overlay the your uh, print over top of the wood, and you carve it out. Yeah, carve, carve it out. I've got some. Uh, I've got the tools here. I'll, I'll just bring them up. I've got some some Japanese uh, hand tools. They're handmade in Japan. Uh-huh. Um, super sharp, and I and I carve everything out by hand. Mm-hmm. I get the carvings done. Um, I've got some rubber rollers, and I roll the ink over the top of the board and uh, squeeze it through an old an old press, and it transfers the thing from the top of the board to the to the paper. Oh wow. That's pretty interesting. I understand you started off by drawing, then you eventually got to the medium you, where you are now. How did that process take place? Well, I was a, I was a drawing major in undergrad. Mm-hmm. And I took a lot of drawing classes, and, and I eventually burned out. Uh, so I was, I was looking for something fresh and something new. Uh, but something I could still use all those skills that I'd, I'd worked for years and years to, to kind of hone in drawing. Um, and, and it just kind of naturally led into printmaking. It was it was something that I, I could still use all those drawing skills that I'd worked so hard to get, but at the same time it was it was fresh and new and interesting. Mm-hmm. And I've just been doing it ever since. And I, I very rarely ever do any just straight drawing work anymore. It's always drawing in order to prepare for a for a print. Mm-hmm. Well, you use a unique subject matter as well. I mean, have you always? Uh, well, what you describe to me, what what? Typically, is your subject matter in your in your work? Well, here recently, the last few years, it's all it's all been Kentucky stories, either either true Kentucky stories from from like news of the weird or from the newspaper or late news, um, and it's it's you'd be surprised how how many odd things happen in real life, just stranger than than you could make up on your own. Mm-hmm. So, a lot of my uh, inspirations come from from news and. Uh, and really, here recently, the last few years, I've been working with with Kentucky monster myths and legends. Mm-hmm. Um, I I've, wasn't born in Kentucky, but I've lived most of my life here. So, so and Kentucky's a very interesting subject in its own because it's 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 definitely got a uh, identity crisis going on. We're we're not north, we're not south, and we've got people here with billions of dollars, and then people with just dollars. Uh-huh. Um, so. It, we got everything going on here, and, and and so it's there's a wide variety of subject matter to deal with. Uh-huh. So have you you've always dealt with topical uh, matters, or is that how you started out? It's not really how I started out. It's when, when I kind of figured out what I wanted to do is when I really took it to the level of, of social commentary and, and and a little bit of satire. Um, so for a long time, it's been dealing with with uh, actual actual events actual things and mm-hmm. or or even you know myths and legends that have in in a lot of ways brought us to where we are right mm-hmm. 
So you deal on topical subjects as well. I mean, do you find yourself, you listen to a story and, hey, you immediately think, I got to put that in print? Yeah, several times. NPR is the best source of <laughs> woodcut <laughs> material. Uh-huh. I've gotten several things off of NPR. Uh-huh. So how, long, how quickly can you uh, generate a, a, a print? No, no, I don't, it's not that. Well, it depends. It depends. I, I teach mm-hmm. at, at several different universities here in Lexington. Mm-hmm. And, and if it's the middle of the school year, it, it seems to take me forever. Um, a, a medium-sized block is probably going to take me two or three months during the school year. Oh, wow. Uh, outside of school in the summer when I, can really, when I can really just sit on a block and go to town, I, I can usually get it started and finished in about two weeks. Mm-hmm. But that's all carving by hand. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do everything. I've got an electric carver, and I'll probably have to get to it eventually because, I, I mean, you just you can't carve into wood too many years without feeling the effects on your knuckles. Mm-hmm. So, I still enjoy doing it by hand. I'm going to do it as long as I can. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was curious. Have you ever uh, carved your work freehand, or you always uh, sketch it out first? I, I always sketch it out. I'm. I'm too anal with my details to, to do anything uh, off the cuff. It, it's all always got to be planned out, mm-hmm. which it's it's bad. I, I wish that I had some more uh, free and open marks in my work, but at the same time, um, going into it without a, a, a plan for the end is a little a little scary for me. Mm-hmm. I, I like to get all the thinking out of the way first, and then I can just sit and watch a movie while I carve. <laughs> I hear you. Um, so you have... I'm sure you get different kinds of reaction when people view your work. What, what what's a typical type of react? Well, it, it it all it all changes. Um, a lot of people think it's funny, and uh, and and it's meant to be funny. But but a lot of people are really offended by it. I don't <laughs> I don't really understand why they're so offended. Um, uh-huh. I, I had a show in um, in Minnesota last year, and. Uh, they had a, a sign-in sheet where, where people could leave comments. Oh no! And, and one person <laughs> left a comment that uh, was saying that I had daddy issues and <laughs> and <laughs> my dad my dad's about my best friend. So uh-huh. absolutely wrong with it. But I don't know I don't know what he saw in the work to th- make him think that I had parent issues. <laughs> <that was not> the- <laughs> uh, at least you take the criticism well, I guess. Yeah. And it, it's just it's weird. People people get affected different ways when they look at it, and that's and that's fine. That's part of viewing artwork. But mm-hmm. it, it is meant to be funny. But you know everything's not funny to everybody. Right. I hear. And I notice as well. I mean, you cram all sorts of subject matters within some of your pieces as well. Yeah. You just bring in everything you could possibly can into it until you fill up your space. Is is a, a little bit. I, I kind of. At one time, I was approaching it as in um, trying to put as many things in there as possible without really a uh, composition in mind, mm-hmm. and just seeing if I could work things around and and have the composition just make itself. And and they got out of control a little bit. A lot of them are just jumbled and hard to read. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I put them out more. It was really just more of an experiment to see if I could get if I get things to work out just from from nothing <laughs> right uh, do you have any inspiration in terms of other artists oh there's a lot I mean printmakers go back a, a long way uh, so there's an awful lot of people to look to look up to there's uh, I mean Albert Durr if, if any woodcarver tells you that Albert Durr isn't their their main person they look up to it's they're probably lying because he's he's widely considered to be the father of printmaking so Albert Durr is, is right up there number one mm-hmm. um Another one that I really looked up to is uh, Gustav Doré, who did a lot of illustrations uh, for books and Edgar Allan Poe and uh, Dante's Inferno. Mm-hmm. Um, it, easier to find in, in books than about anywhere else. Uh, Posada from from Mexico is a is a big inspiration. Um, and, and then there's a lot of contemporary printmakers, people like Bill Fick, who teaches at uh, I believe UNC. I'm not. I think North Carolina. I'm not positive. It's either North Carolina or Duke. That could be a big mistake. Right. <laughs> um, Tom Huck from St. Louis, he's, he's another person to look up to. And, and really any any contemporary printmakers. Cannonball Press up in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. um, they do a lot of things that engage a lot of people who who wouldn't be involved in printmaking uh, and kind of bring them in. And, you know, at one time printmaking was a thing that we saw 50 times on a, on a walk down the street and, and you don't see it anymore. Everything's digital. 
Right. Um, so it's it, it's good and interesting to see people bringing back, you know, bringing interest in the things that we've lost interest in. Mm-hmm. You know, people that do that, I, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, do you find uh, that the, you have more students that uh, are participating in the bringing printmaking back? A little bit, a little bit. Uh, it depends on on the university. I've got a, uh, you know, uh, in a lot of programs, printmaking is is required for certain majors, mm-hmm. and and that sparks a lot of interest. If I can get a student in class, I can get them interested in printmaking. But if you're at a university that it, printmaking isn't required, it's more of a struggle because they don't have to take it. Right. They can take other things, other things that they've heard of, like ceramics and painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I can get them in class, I can get them. I can get them interested and pumped about it. That's nice. Uh, so, where would you like to see your work evolve from here? You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's uh, it's ever evolving, and I, I have no idea where it's going to go mm-hmm. uh, from one year to the next. Um, and a lot of things kind of happen by accident, and, and they stumble into these things. I, I never planned on doing uh, Kentucky Monster Myths and Legends, and, and I read a book about it, mm-hmm. and then I worked for three years making prints uh-huh. about it. So it's it, it's a lot just happenstance. Things that just happen, you know. Mm-hmm. I've been with the creator for about a year now, and every exhibit's quite a bit different, and this is probably one, one, one of the more unusual exhibits we're going to be displaying since I've been involved. Especially the, the size. I mean, we're going to be looking at a number of prints, which are going to be a four by eight foot mm-hmm. in size, with a lot of content. So I think a lot of people will be interested, in, particularly in the imaging, and plus the magnitude of the pieces will be interesting as well. Yeah, I, I really like I really like working large. It's 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 for being the same method, and and you carve everything the same, you draw it the same, and you print it the same. It, it's a completely different beast whenever you start working on something four foot by eight foot, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's and it's a lot of fun. But it's, I mean, it takes a long time. Those block, I'll be, I'll work on a block the better part of a year for mm-hmm. those. It's and it's a pretty constant struggle and battle and keeping interested and 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 keeping the work ethic up mm-hmm. is always the hard thing for those. And that seems to be a constant with a number of artists. It's, it's, it does involve a lot of work. And, and your work yeah. certainly displays that as well. Do you have any words of wisdom for uh, other printmakers out there who might be thinking about uh, this as a as a as a adventure in their life? As a, as, as in doing printmaking uh, printmaking for a long time. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> long term printmaking. Um, well, really, the the best advice you can give any any artist, it doesn't even have to be a printmaker, is is for every minute that you're not making art. There's people who are passing you, and and the people that are passing you are getting closer to their goal of making a living with their art. I see. And and if you take time off, um, I mean it's 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 a hard job. It's a hard job to get a job in printmaking. Mm-hmm. So you just you just got to keep your nose down. Mm-hmm. Well, we certainly look, looking forward to the opening your exhibit again. It's going to be from March 3rd to the 24th. Uh, we will be having opening reception on Friday, March 2nd from 6 to 8 p.m. So um, we look forward to opening your show. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Derek. I think I'm better than anyone else. Just try to help you help your... The Kentucky Monster Mash is a is a, is a 14-piece um, individual conglomerate of prints that, that piece together to make uh, one long narrative. Um... I've carved it and drawn them in a way that they can be completely rearranged in, in almost uh, an unlimited amount of number of, of different ways, and, and it still reads as a complete uh, universal narrative. Um, and I didn't really plan it out to be that way. I'd, I'd read a book about Kentucky monsters and, and, and got kind of inspired and wanted to do some prints about it, so I, I did a blot. I had a list. I've kept notes, and I had a list of about 15 different, different stories from all over the state. Uh, are you going to be? Are we going to have all these then at the prairie then? Yeah, this is the first time I'm going to show them all together. Okay, good. So I, I started out. I drew. I drew and carved one block, and that's really all I'd plan on ever doing. And um, I had a list of like 15 monsters. And I only got to about four of them, so I, I wasn't really happy with that. So I decided to do two, and it, 
But if I well, if I'm going to do two pieces of the same subject matter, I, I want to make it so they can they can be rearranged and, and hung in uh, different combinations and still line up. Mm-hmm. So I drew the I drew the second block and it worked fine. But then I was really depressed because then I had two blocks and they could only be shown two ways. So it really didn't matter if I if I worked that hard to figure out how how to get them to line up. So I decided to do three, and then I did the third one. And then I realized you could still only show it about two different ways. <laughs> so then I did four, and then I did four more, and then I did six more. <laughs> so I see. You, you could literally just line them right up, and they just blend continually on. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, and, and there's, I mean, it took about, it, it took the better part of, uh, of about three years of planning and carving and printing to get these to line up. Mm-hmm. And get them all done and, and, and finished, but uh, and I've never shown them anywhere, so it's going to be interesting to see what they all look like together. I've so I've sold a couple of complete sets of them, but I, I've never seen them all hanging out together. So mm-hmm. to see pictures of it, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll go through and, and, and kind of name some of my favorites. Um, Kentucky Monster Mash Part One. Uh, there's a character dressed up like Batman with overalls. Mm-hmm. That's based off of a guy named Lightning Jack, who uh, a, a lot of people believe was actually Jack the Ripper. And uh, at the same time that Jack the Ripper was was uh, in in London, <laughs> he was uh, there was another guy named Lightning Jack that would wear a cape and a mask, and and he would always jump out and and grab women late at night when they were walking down the street, and they never caught him because he could run really fast and jump really high. And, and I guess back then that's all it took to get away. Mm-hmm. So uh, at one point, Jack, um, Lightning Jack disappears, and then he he shows back up in Louisville, Kentucky. So they they think they think that it's the same guy, but they're but they're not really sure. But yeah, and it's from what I hear, it, it's actually the what the comic book character Batman was based off of, because he would wear a mask and and a cape, and the mask had the little. Uh, the little bat ears on it. So how long ago was this story from? Oh, this would have been like, I guess it's like the 1700s. Oh, okay. 1800s? I don't know, a long time ago. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's true or not, but I did read that on the internet, and, you know, everything you read on the internet is true. Yeah, definitely. So that... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, let's see. Uh, on the Kentucky Monster Mash Part 4, mm-hmm. there's a... My favorite one in that one. This is actually the first block I did for for this whole series. Um, there's a Cyclops gorilla, and uh, there's a there's an old ancient Indian burial ground in the town next to Lexington. It, it's a little town called Nicholasville, and there's this there's this rumor that the the Indians put a curse on this burial mound that if you mess with it, the Cyclops gorilla would come out of a tree and kill your pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Not the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which I guess, I guess back then it was a big deal. But uh-huh. I don't know anyone that has pigs anymore, but but maybe everybody did until they messed with the mound. You never know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did away with them. <laughs> so on on Kentucky Monster Match Part Five, there's this there's there's a giant alligator, and this is all part of a hoax. There, there's another small town on the other side of Lexington uh, named Winchester. And these these kids took a picture of an alligator and photoshopped it in front of their pond, in front of their parents' house, mm-hmm. and and passed it off as, as an actual picture of a 25 foot long alligator, <laughs> and, and it made it all the way and it was published in the New York Times. Oh man, um, not even sure when when that was, but it, it ended up coming clean that it was a hoax. So uh, I've got a giant 24 foot uh, alligator there. Mm-hmm. In in part seven. Uh, I put zombies in it. I've got a love affair with zombies. I mean, I grew up in the 80s, which was uh, Return of the Living Dead and all those movies, and, and I just love them. I ate them up. I still watch a lot of them. Uh-huh. Um, but Return of the Living Dead was, was set in Louisville, which was good enough for me to include them in, into this whole series. There, there's not actual <laughs> legends about zombies in Kentucky, except for that movie, so I just I just added them. Yeah, um, if you could do Cyclops Gorillas, you could do zombies. That's right. Complete, complete artistic license. <laughs> In part eight, um, there's a there's a devil duck snake, which I, 
that's really the, all the information I get. It's just this weird hybrid monster that's supposed to be in the mountains in eastern Kentucky. Part devil, part duck, and part snake. They're doing a keg stand. <laughs> We're doing, yeah, that, that's the chupacabra doing a keg stand, uh, and, and the, there's some giant Smurfs. I've always heard. Uh, I mean, everybody knows the rumors on on Kentucky. We're all inbred, you know. Um, and and this this I've, I've never seen it. I, I live close to Eastern Kentucky, but it, we're, there's still a couple hours away. Um, but I've heard that there's mountain people that have blue skin. <laughs> And, and I don't know if that's true. People swear that they've seen it. I've never seen it. So so these are some giant Smurfs. And I don't really... I hear it's some kind of like hereditary skin disorder that, that they turn blue. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know for real. Um, they probably do exist. Also, right in the back is, is... That's Daniel Boone wrestling Bigfoot. And I, I looked... <laughs> I looked this up because Daniel Boone was actually the first American to report a Bigfoot sighting. Oh man! And it was. Like... <laughs> He's so Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone's in this. I did not know that. <laughs> and let's see, down in uh, part eleven, I've got a a mini gorilla riding a, a giant lizard. They don't actually. There's no myth with it where they're together. There's just myths of, of mini creatures and giant lizards, so... <laughs> but, uh, uh, what about the parachuting snakes, though? Parachuting snakes, that was a rumor that the government was, was parachuting in rattlesnakes to take care of the rodent problem in the mountains. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, the, they don't do... They actually work really hard to keep, you know, animals out of places they're not supposed to be, so they, they would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, I mean, there's blogs all over the Internet about... Uh, Parachuting rattlesnakes into Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, part twelve. Part twelve's got a, it, it's got a lot of my favorite ones that I found. Um, right in the front, that's the axe handle hound. Which, uh, if you leave your axe out overnight, the axe handle hound is going to come up and eat the handle. And uh, I, I don't really know the origin of the story, but I, I'm pretty sure it's something that that loggers at one time came up with to to kind of. Uh, tell the story on how they lost their axes overnight. Mm -hmm. So yeah, is this dog that's just supposed to go around and eat, eat your axe handles. Uh, over his over his shoulder on the right, that's a side hill wampus, which is a, a type of cat that lives at the top of mountains. And he's got one, one set of legs are, are longer than the other set. And the reason for that is so he can walk around a mountain peak and, and not have to squat on one side. Because mountain peaks all, all are like this, right? Exactly. <laughs> So the, the side hill wampus, it, it's hard to tell on my website, but he's wearing lifts on one side. I so do see that, yes. Stand up straight. Uh -huh. <laughs> and on the on the other side, on part 13, there's a, there's a man dog. And that one, I'm, I'm not so happy with my carving on the man dog. Um, it, it, he looks good, and, and the tones and everything are, are printed right, but his face is supposed to be more... More like hu like a human's. Uh huh. Part of this that I'm really not not happy about in any of these, and it's it's that one part. He looks good, but he just doesn't look th like a man. And he's supposed to be a man dog, half man, half dog. Uh huh. <laughs> so that that one I'm not I'm not too happy with. Um, part nine. Part nine's got a meat rain. Um, and that's that actually happened in Kentucky. There's. Uh, there's news stories all, all over the internet about it and not, it was like 40 or 50 years ago I'm not exactly sure and, and they don't even know what caused it but on this one person's farm out in the middle of the country it just started raining meat and they've never figured out why people people think that a tornado heat li hit like a meat factory or a meat packaging and it just carried it and just dumped it on this one person's property they, they have no idea where it came from but it, one person's property rained meat for an entire like hour. Nice. Which is just bizarre. Uh, and on the and part fourteen is uh, is called a billadad, which is uh, half kangaroo, half beaver, and and half bird. It's just this bizarre. It's one of the, one of those bizarre like combinations of animals. Mm -hmm. Which is, I'm I'm actually starting to, to work a little bit with uh, now on, on a lot smaller scale. Um, New work that I think I'm going to be sending up is I've got a cooniger, which is a half raccoon and half alligator, 
and a tuna corn, which is a tuna fish with a unicorn horn. Nice. <laughs> uh, I've been working a lot with the combinations of animals lately. Uh-huh. For the for the Kentucky mishmash, uh, we were talking a little earlier about how they're so jam packed, and, and I was I was trying to make a composition out of just sheer luck, I guess, of things working out. And, mm-hmm. and a Kentucky mishmash is a good a good example of how it doesn't work out. <laughs> this has got this has got an awful lot of stories throughout Kentucky uh, for for hundreds of years, and and I've just jam packed it all into into about two two by eight foot, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's a mess and it's a lot to look at, um, but in a lot of ways in a lot of ways it works because it is such a mess you you have to look pretty close at it to really see what's going on. Mm. So in one way, it, it works without a composition just because you have to pay that much attention to it. Um, but some of my favorite stories that are in here are uh, right in the middle. Right in the middle of, between the two guns is mm. uh, is Cassius Clay. who Not the boxer, who's also from Kentucky. Um, Cassius Clay, as in Henry Clay's brother, who was a, a politician and was, was really good friends with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, both of the Clay brothers were from, from Kentucky and real close to the Lexington area. Um, but Cassius Clay was insane. He was crazy. Um, he, was, uh, he was completely anti-slavery and, and would do speeches uh, in Kentucky trying, you know, really trying to, to work the cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he'd get hit a lot uh, by, by slave owners in Kentucky. And, and actually right down the street about probably about a mile uh, from my house, uh, he was giving a speech on the on the steps of one of the old libraries downtown, and this guy was heckling him. So, so Cassius Clay pulls out his Bowie knife and jumps off the stage on this guy and and cuts his ear, nose, and carves his eye out. Oh man! It's a huge crowd of people, and and he's just he's just about to just murder this guy, and they his friends had to run up and and grab the guy and throw him over the fence to save his life. Uh-huh. <laughs> And this, this is, I mean, this guy was was really good friends with Abraham Lincoln, but but Lincoln started to get really worried about about having him on his side because he would he took things so seriously he was going to kill for it. <laughs> um, he turned him into the ambassador for Russia and, and sent him off to Russia for a bunch of years, but he ended up murdering a, a few people over there and they brought him back. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, and and then right above right above. Uh, Cassius Clay is, is a bunch of people holding up body parts, and uh, this is this is one of the, the more funny stories that I've ran across. It was uh, a doctor that had that was had gotten really sick, and he didn't really talk to his family that much, but his whole family knew he was a doctor, knew he had a lot of money. So when he was on his deathbed, they all would come up and say, "Oh, you know, I just I would love to have something to remember you by." So. Uh, and all of them were doing it. People that hadn't talked to him for 20 years were, were, I just would love to have something to remember you by. So when he died, he left a will and willed each member of the family a piece of his body. <laughs> <laughs> and donated all of his money to the surgeon that did the autopsy. <laughs> so that, that was a pretty good story. Um, and let's see, what else have we got in here? There, we got people looking down barrels of shotguns. There's been a few people that have died... Looking down the barrel to see if it's loaded. Right. Um, let's see, in the and and kind of close to the top left corner, there's there's a guy in a in a glass case, mm-hmm. and that's that's Speedy Atkins, and that's my hometown is uh, Paducah, Kentucky, in western Kentucky, mm-hmm. and uh, Speedy is a petrified man, and he was on display for years in Paducah, and uh, and even when I was a kid, he was on display. He's not on display anymore. I think they've actually buried him now. Uh, but there was a there was a big flood, and and Speedy floated away for a little while, <laughs> and then eventually eventually floated back. <laughs> <laughs> was there a tide in so Kentucky? <laughs> yeah, yeah, back back into the same back in the same town. He, he missed it and came back. Um, but there's there's also there's a lot of tragic stories that that I've got here. Um, the bottom the bottom with the two shot kids and, and Santa Claus. Uh, is a story I read about uh, this husband who dressed up like Santa Claus to surprise the the family and came inside. Everybody was excited, and, and somebody had gotten a shotgun for Christmas, so he was just gonna 
kind of played with it, picked it up, and was and was playing with it, and and shot his wife in the face. So could you could you imagine the trauma that these kids have grown up with mm-hmm. after Santa Claus come in and shoot their mom <laughs> in front of them on Christmas morning? Um, just just from being an idiot has just scarred these kids and probably the, these kids like kids and grandkids for life. Mm-hmm. Uh, just awful, awful. Oh man. And and up in up in Kentucky mishmash too. This one. This one I, I kind of learned my lesson with with the the first one, and, and I kind of tried to focus more on the composition and not cramming so many things in, in it, into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's see. On the on the left is uh, a <laughs> is a story about this woman uh, in the mall here in Lexington that would sneak into Victoria's Secret and uh, get a bunch of underwear and try them all on. But then would just run out of the store wearing them. So she'd come into Victoria's Secret, put on five or six pairs of panties, and then and then put on her pants and just walk out. Right. They caught on to her about the fourth or fifth time she did it, and they they busted in when she was when she was trying them on, getting ready to steal them, and and she just took off running, it took off running <laughs> through the mall with nothing but her panties on. Uh-huh. <laughs> And uh, over over on the right side is uh, is a woman that got arrested for a DUI here in Lexington, and and she tried to escape. Whenever they were making her change into ro- the orange jumpsuit, she tried to escape by squ- squirting the policeman in the face with her with the milk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and this this is just these are things that you can't make up. Yeah. I mean, these are ch- stories. None of this is is made up. Yeah. Um, over between between the two is a is a husband and wife, a newlyweds having a knife fight. This actually happened down the street from my parents' house. Um, I think before before I was born, it happened down the street from my parents' house. It was newlyweds had just moved into this house, and they got in a fight about something, and and it spilled over into the yard, and they they ended up stabbing each other to death on on the front yard. They killed each other. <laughs> It was a pretty serious argument. Oh man! <laughs> and uh, these—I I, don't—the only part about this that I don't know if are true in Kentucky or not is the log cabin trailer and the the church trailer. But we've got plenty of things that are close enough that I just kind of took some liberties. <laughs> um, that's one thing that you see a lot of are, are trailer parks that people have, have done like quite a bit of work on their trailers. Um, I haven't seen any log cabins, but I've seen I've seen uh, double wide trailers, which is just two single wide trailers right next to each other, so they can or double highs. I've seen them stacked on top of each other. Oh man! <laughs> so I know I know those two are going for sure. Uh-huh. Um, the duct tape bandit was a a guy who who would go around and rob gas stations all around this area. But he didn't wear a mask. He'd wrap his face up with duct tape, and uh, and they caught him, and and put his picture up on the news. And and that's that's what he looks like. In fact, I had this up in a show at the art league here in Lexington, and and somebody came up to me and asked me, is, is that supposed to be the duct tape bandit on both sides? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I went to high school with a guy. It looks just like him. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually been a, a little bit of a. Of a funny thing that I didn't really expect to happen, uh-huh. um, making woodcuts based in Kentucky was were for people to have that direct of of a relationship with the stories that I that I put on here. Right. So that was pretty interesting for to have somebody go to high school with the, the subject of one of the woodcuts. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he should have bought a print, that's for sure. Yeah, he should have. He should have. <laughs> uh, behind that, uh, we've got the the porn and liquor store. I don't know if they have those. Uh, anywhere else, but we've got some some porn and liquor stores where you can. It's just like the one stop shop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, we had a school bus driver get in a lot of trouble for stopping at the the porn and liquor store on the way way home from school with kids on the bus. <laughs> with kids, yeah, with kids on the bus. Um, we had a uh, we had this group of guys that that went on a big ATM robbery spree. They, they would go up and chain their bumper to the front of the ATM machine and then drive off and, and gink the front of the machine off and then go and steal all the money. 
Mm. So, uh, one time they tried to do it here in town, and, and it actually ripped the bumper off the back of the truck. With a license plate on it. Freaked out, and, and just drove away. Uh, and they got caught pretty quick, because they left their license plate on the bumper. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually heard that story before. Did you? <laughs> yeah, a lot of these a lot of these are coming from um, from a website called fark.com, F-A-R-K.com. Mm. Yep. Uh, and it's actually it was actually started by uh, a UK University of Kentucky student, um, mm-hmm. and, and it's not just focused on Kentucky. Although there is a lot of Kentucky stories on there, but it's it's a good way to go and find stories that you've missed or people don't put in the newspaper right. um, from all over the country. You can select it down to, to different states, um, and he's from Kentucky too. I haven't put him in any prints yet, but but maybe at some point. <laughs> Let's see. Um, deep fried Kentucky wieners is right below that. I'm gonna send that one up too. Uh, oh man, um, <laughs> that does not look good. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is got it doesn't have a whole lot of stories in it, uh, but the ones that are in it are, are pretty good. Uh, the guy holding the chicken leg is is a guy. So I'm not sure where in Kentucky he's from, but he sued KFC because he claimed that they sold him a penis. Uh, shaped chicken leg. So that's there's Colonel Sanders cracking up and and he's crying holding the chicken leg. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, he didn't win the lawsuit because most chicken legs, you know, really kind of looked like that anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but he he didn't win the lawsuit, um, but it was a pretty funny story, so I put it in. Mm-hmm. Um, next to next to that is a is a robber holding a, a bologna sandwich, and this happened down. The, down the street from my, my parents' house as well. I, I've got a... There's a doctor that lives a, about a mile down the road, and he was out of town, and this guy broke into the house and was robbing him. And, but he got really hungry, so he went and woke up the wife and asked her to make him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the robber telling the wife to, to be quiet while uh-huh. he's holding the peanut butter sandwich. Um... All the way over in the corner with the holding the shotgun is uh, is Hunter S. Thompson. No, no, it's not. It's not Hunter S. Thompson. It's Ralph Steadman. Uh, Ralph Steadman. Um, if, if you don't know who he is, is, is the artist who did all the illustrations for for a lot of Hunter S. Thompson's books. He did the the poster and the cover for um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, the movie and the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's from England and. From what I hear, I don't know if this is true either, but but I've, I've read it in some books and I've heard a lot of people tell me this story. But in Lexington, that he actually spent a little bit of time in a mental institution, and it was right around the same time that the the lithos for Fairy and Loathing in Las Vegas was, were being printed. Uh-huh. So when the printing company got them printed, uh, they called him up and said, "We've got the po- we got the posters done. We'll bring them out for you to sign." And he said, "Sure, just bring a shotgun with you, and and we'll we'll do this." And, and they were like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean bring a shotgun? And he goes, well, I, I've decided I'm going to shoot them. And they were like, well, you can't, you can't shoot these prints. We just printed them. They're, they're perfect. You can't shoot them. He goes, well, I'm not going to sign them until you let me shoot them. So they, they finally broke down and, and brought a shotgun out to the mental institution and, and hung up all the posters. And he cocked the shotgun and, and shot all the prints and then walked up and signed them. So if... If the story is true and you actually see any of these prints, mm-hmm. like from this certain edition from Free Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, you ought to be able to find little tiny bullet holes in it. I've never, I've never actually seen an actual like the the poster that this is supposed to be based on. I've never actually seen that poster in person, so I have no idea. But I've had several people tell me that story. Oh, man. <laughs> Good story. The true stories from Kentucky Backwoods. This was this is actually the first print that I started to use true stories from Kentucky in, and, and it's not so big. It's only it's only about four foot by two foot. Um, but uh, this is actually a linoleum cut, which is uh, I've got it mislabeled on my website. It's a linoleum cut. It's the process is all the same. It's just instead of carving on a, on a piece of plywood, I'm carving on like old kitchen floor linoleum. Uh-huh. Um, the stories that, that I've got on here are the, the two main figures are uh, is a guy holding a shotgun and, and another guy with a, a PBR can on his head. And uh, 
I, I teach at the University of Kentucky, and we've got like half of the campus is the UK hospital. And, and there's not really many hospitals in eastern Kentucky, so if something serious happens, they get airlifted in here. So in the summertime, it, you hear helicopters all day long. And everybody always says that it's because people that are deer hunting got bored and started shooting beer cans off each other's heads. And I thought they were joking, except I do know that it happened one time. And <laughs> so this is two guys out hunting, um, and they got bored because they're not finding any deer, so they just decided to start shooting beer cans off each other's heads. Um, and he just got blasted in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't really funny, but I mean, it's just... It's just so stupid. <laughs> why would anybody do that? You assume they're empty beer cans, and why are they empty? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you're drunk, then the one thing you don't want to do is try to shoot beer cans off your buddy's head. Uh, or at least you go first. <laughs> Our, uh, all right, there's there's the guy with the black leather jacket with the, with the truck on the roof. This is a... <laughs> this was probably about 10 years ago. I remember this before I... I think I was a sophomore in, in undergrad. And this was a story of, uh, of a guy that... Him and his buddies were, at, were just drinking out in the backyard. And they, they got pretty drunk and decided it would be a good idea to build a ramp up to the roof of their house. And so he could take his truck up there and drive around. So... So that's what they did. And he drove his truck up to the roof. But, you know, roofs, roofs aren't made made to withstand the weight of the truck. So the first thing he started to do was collapse the roof in. And they had to get a crane come and, and lift the truck off the top of the house. And this was actually the front page of the paper the next day. It, it was this guy cracking up, holding a, a Budweiser can with, <laughs> with his truck about to collapse his entire house. And he just thought it was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> It is. You know, it, it, a lot, it, Kentucky is not really like these woodcuts. Uh, I'm just picking out the the best stories that I hear. Uh -huh. You know, they, they would be interesting if it, if it wasn't like the cream of the crop stories. <laughs> um, so don't, don't expect to drive through Kentucky and and see things like this <laughs> on the side of the road every turn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, so the holy water hose down. I, I mentioned that I get stories off of NPR every once in a while. And this is this is one of my favorite ones that I got, um, and, and I'm not sure I'm not sure where this took place, um, but the holy water hose down is is based off of a story that NPR ran on a church that had that had been burned down. So the church burned down, but they they still wanted to hold services with the with the congregation. Everybody still involved, but they didn't really have a venue. So they were looking around town to find a place that they could they could hold services in until they until they built this new church, and they had an old movie theater that was abandoned. So they they moved in there, but the the thing is the movie theater used to be the the town's old porno theater. So right in the middle of, of like one of the Sunday school rooms was just mountains and mountains of vintage porn. So they decided instead of having a, a groundbreaking ceremony, they would just have a big bonfire where they'd, they'd burn up all this old porn and and just kind of welcome everybody to the new venue. So, uh, before it started, they called the fire department and and had them come out just in case the film got out of hand. If, if anybody had seen The the Inglorious Bastards, you know, that whole, the ending of that movie was where the theater burns down because the film is so explosive. And it was the same, it was the same deal. They didn't want it to get out of hand. Right. So they had, they had the, the fire department come out so when the fire department showed up, uh, the priest blessed the truck and, and asked to have all the water inside of it turned into holy water. So everything went fine at the barbecue, and, and nothing happened, nothing got out of hand. So at the end of the night, the firemen just kind of released the hoses, and, and all the kids just played in the water. Um, so this was this was what I envisioned having, happening next, which was that... <laughs> That all the popes and all the clergy would join forces with the fire department and travel around the country, following Girls Gone Wild, and just <laughs> hose them down with the holy water. Yeah. <laughs> so we we've got uh, in this scene we've got we've got a, a Girls Gone Wild shoot and and popes with water guns filled with ho holy water 
and people with fire hoses hosing down the girls. <laughs> Children play out of harm's way where they don't do anything to you. Take me back to my yard when life don't seem so hard. When we all hold hands, we understand the meaning of hallelujah.